Thanks, everybody, for coming along. The, uh, the title of this talk is Terminology Aware Analytics with Fire. And the, the idea is to just sort of step you through a bit of a sort of data engineering, data prep workflow that takes clinical terminology into account and highlight some of the issues that lie in that area and how that they can be solved with the use of fire and fire terminology services. So the idea coming out of this um, talk is that you have a better idea of how to query, or one approach anyway, of how to query and analyse a fire data set. I put potentially big there because I think my approach is a little bit different to others in that I'm using sort of Spark and cluster computing to help augment my flow, so we'll talk a bit more about that. And um, also, learning how to leverage the knowledge within the clinical codes by interacting with a fire terminology server as part of your analytics workflow. So I've um, put some resources up in a, in a GitHub repo to sort of go alongside this presentation and there's a few files in there that contain m much more detail that's in the presentation. You can sort of follow along with that and you can run it yourself. So there's some Jupyter notebooks and some example data. So feel free to go along to that repo and clone it down and have a play around. So the tools I'm going to use in this example are uh, Jupyter Notebook, Python, Pandas, the normal Python data anal an analysis type tools, and also Apache Spark, which is a, a, a general sort of cluster computing framework, but it has a lot of tools for analytics as well. Um, what we start with is a... Um, so we're also going to use Cynthia. So Cynthia is a, um, if you're not um, familiar with it, is the synthetic patient um, generator. And what you can do is you can say to Cynthia, give me a thousand patients and it will um, take in a whole bunch of demographic statistics and um, sort of disease models and it will generate longitudinal patient records in fire um, over a span of about 80 years for each of those patients. So you'll end up with a thousand odd fire bundles which contain sort of encounters, medication requests, procedure requests, all the different touch points of that um, synthetic patient with the healthcare system. And it's really useful, this data is really useful for testing out software systems or um, doing stuff like this. So um, you can easily um, generate your own synthetic patient um, data set by just cloning down the Cynthia um, repository and running it. And that little seed at the end is um, just so that you get the same sort of results as I got and you can have a bit of reproducibility. So that's what you end up with. You end up with a, a list of um, a, a bunch of fire bundles and um, then, once you have those fire bundles, um, you can load that into your analytics tool of choice. Um, before we do that, get yourself a nice notebook. I, I like this one. Um, if it's, it's kind of nice to use Docker. Um, it, it encapsulates your environment quite nicely. There's, Jupyter has a whole bunch of... Um, pre-made Docker images with a whole bunch of different stacks of tools in them. I'm using this one called All Spark, which includes a whole bunch of stuff, including Python and R and Apache Spark and the Python and R libraries that interact with Apache Spark. Um, so I'm also using a tool called Bunsen. So Bunsen is a set of, um, is, a, is a library that can take fire data and encode it in a, in a Spark data set. And um, once you have, once you've brought that into Spark, you can then do analysis on it, um, either on just your local computer or across a cluster. And you can also encode it into 
analytics friendly formats that you can put into a warehouse like Apache Parquet. So what we're doing here is we're saying go to our directory that we just generated all our synthetic patient data into, grab each bundle, extract each type of resource out of that bundle and make one table for each resource. So what we end up with is, is um, a patient data set, an observation data set, a medication request data set. And it's a um, nested data structure, so it mirrors what's in the fire resource exactly. Um, and we can query it via SQL using Apache Spark. So pr pretty much just plain SQL, you can join across patients and observations, um, all that sort of stuff. What we do here is we actually um, write it down to a Parquet file. So if you're going to be using this later, it's, it's convenient to sort of take it out of its fire form, which is not very efficient to deal with, um, write it down to this Parquet file, and effectively that's, that's just your, sort of your analytics table that you can load into memory later on and interact with within a notebook context or any other context, really. So, once we've got our, um, our fire data sort of transformed and prepped and ready to analyse, what we can do is we can load it in to memory effectively. So inside, we're in our notebook now, we can, we can just sort of do spark.read parquet and read that parquet file in and then we have a Spark data set. And w then we can do SQL on it, we can do all sorts of relational operations on it. And, um, and this can all happen um, not necessarily locally. So this is what, what I was talking about when I'm talking about big data. So, you know, you've got your R environment, you've got your Python environment, you can't uh, locally on your computer or in, even on your notebook server, you can't really deal with anything that's bigger than memory or bigger than what you can process on that computer. So what you can do is you can prep the data on the cluster, summarise it, reshape it, and then just bring it down to your analysis environment when you're ready to, and when it's in a manageable form, I suppose. So now that we have the, these Spark data sets, we can do stuff with them. So, for example, you can sort of select gender, birth date, deceased date, time, and you can, and, and then this to pandas thing is what brings it into your local analytics environment. So you can convert that Spark data set into a pandas data frame, then you can do all the normal stuff that you do in your Python environment. So um, once we've converted to pandas, we can then render it out in our notebook as a normal pandas data frame. Um, by the way, this is the sort of query DSL that um, comes with Spark, but you can also just use SQL. So I could have rewritten this as sort of just a call to a SQL method and just said select gender, birth date, deceased date, time from patients, and it would do the exact same thing. Um, so... Um, once we've done that, we can um, just do um, normal sort of exploratory data analysis type things like get, just have a, get a feel for our synthetic patient data set. So yes, we've generated sort of about 1,500 patients. Some of them are alive, some of them are dead. Um, advance. <laughs> um, and, you know, it kind of looks like a, a normal population. So we've got a sort of realistic distribution across our ages and, and genders and that sort of thing. And this is actually driven by real statistics from like the... Um, it's, it's US based, so it's taken from um, statistical Census Bureau statistics and CDC and that sort of thing is used as input into Cynthia. So now um, we want to actually do something interesting. <coughs> So we, we want to look at the disease profile of this population, for example. So what we can do is ask our data at a certain date, what, what are the conditions that 
my patients have. So maybe I'll pick this date, um, 1st of June this year, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to join my patients to my conditions, right? And um, in FIRE, we, we, a patient doesn't store its conditions, the conditions store the references back to the patients. So we're just joining on the patient ID to the reference within the subject element of the condition. Um, and all this um, messy stuff is dealing with, um, okay, a condition has an onset and a condition has an abatement, or it may have those missing. Um, so we, w we want things that where the onset is less than the report date, the abatement is after the report date, or if they're missing, just sort of assume that it was active all the way back to birth or to death or end of the simulation. So that should get us our patients and our conditions. Press the old fashioned way. Um, okay, and, and so this data is nested. So what we've got now is we've selected our ID and our condition code. Now, as you probably know, um, a code is a code, a code, the condition code is a codable concept. So it has, can have multiple codings within it. Um, so it's actually um, an array within our, our, our structure here. Um, so in order to deal with this, we need to flatten it out and sort of bring it out uh, into effectively a column. Um, and the way we do that in, in Spark is we use this sort of function, explode. There's two, f there's two variations of it, explode and explode outer. Explode outer just puts a null there if there's an empty array, effectively like a left outer join. And you can see the difference here. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. But this is now just directly a structure, um, single cardinality, whereas before it was actually an array. So that's actually flattened that out for us. And now we can directly access stuff like the code. So now that we can access our codes, we can create a, a bit of a table like this. And this is our top 10 um, conditions by number of patients. And keep in mind, these are overlapping. So obviously, a patient can have more than one of these. Um, so we've, de we've determined that we have 106 distinct SNOMED CT condition codes within our data set. Great. Now what do we do with it? Um, so now we can think about how, could we pos how are we going to sort of make sense of this data? How are we going to group these conditions up? Because especially in SNOMED, we can have very fine-grained um, codes. Um, and usually when uh, we want to bring those up to a higher level of um, generalise them into, into grouping categories of some sort. So value sets are your friend. Um, we can define sets of codes using the FIRE value set resource that allows to categorise our data, that allows to group it um, and filter it so we can do aggregate analytics. So value sets can be defined as just a simple enumeration of codes, pick, or pick your codes one by one and put them in your value set. Or the smarter way to do it is to actually describe rules or criteria that match certain codes with certain attributes um, and include them or exclude them. And this is much easier to maintain because um, you're insulated from changes to the actual codes themselves. You only have to sort of maintain a small set of rules rather than a huge list of codes. So SNOMED CT specifically has even more tools to, um, to help you here. SNOMED itself has a rich expression language um, called expression constraint language, which allows you to do all sorts of funky things to describe sets of codes within SNOMED. And this is completely been surfaced um, through the FIRE terminology services API. And you can use it within your value set definitions, which is really cool. Um, there's also tools to help you um, do this. So there's a tool called Shrimp, 
which allows you to explore the SNOMED ontology and sort of see, okay, well, I've got this really fine-grained code. Well, what codes are up the hierarchy from that which may be suitable for grouping, possibly? What, what, gr what codes come under those? Um, lets you explore the ontology and it also lets you author these expression constraint language expressions to, that you can then put into your value set definitions. And once you've got that value set definition, you can then execute that and get the full set of codes for your analytics. So this is shrimp. So here we've got um, hyperglycemic disorder code. So we, this might be a code that we found in our data. Okay, so we can see there's things both more specific and more general than this code. Um, if we click on its parent disorder of glucose regulation, we can see that um, we've taken it up a level. So now we've got hypoglycemic disorder under it, but we've got a bunch of other things as well. Um, and what we can, what this um, bringing it up to disorder of glucose regulation actually gives us 115 sort of descendants there. So we've captured this whole category of diseases there now. So this is a, the ECL builder. So this is actually a tool that's part of Shrimp that we can sort of graphically add, um, you know, rules and constraints to sort of build up an ECL expression, which is this thing here. And, um, and once we've got this thing here, we can put that into our um, fire value set um, as our definition of the codes that we w want to be in that value set. So this is what our value set might look like. Um, it might be simply um, include SNOMED CT with the filter um, concept is a this code. And what that means is that um, a descendants or self, this code and all its descendants are included in, in this value set. And that's our disorder of glucose regulation code. So this would, upon expanding this value set, we'd get 115 SNOMED codes. An alternate way of expressing this is to use the constraint property. So like everything, there's more than one way to do things. And um, constraint lets you actually put in a full ECL expression. So the, the previous one lets you just do descendants and self. This one lets you put arbitrary ECL expressions. So you can use the full power of ECL. Um, and in, in Shrimp, there's this little link up the top there, which is um, ECL help, which is a really useful resource. And it will show you all the things you can do with ECL. Um, you know, so there's a whole bunch of different operators and you can get into relationships as well. You know, so you might say, you might want to get um, sort of clinical findings with a p your body site of your right arm or something and you can go into the relationships um, of the codes and actually filter things that way. So there's a, there's a lot of power in this to do really um, uh, complex um, definitions of, of exactly which codes you want to be in your, in your value set. So once we ha we've got our, our value set, now we want to bring this into Spark so that we can um, join it across to our clinical data and use it to group our clinical data. So this code is just doing a HTTP post request to um, the Fire Terminology Services API, the expand operation of the value set resource, and just passing in our value set that we created as the body. And then this code is just plucking out of that the expansion that comes back um, the system and the code of each of the results of that expansion. So we will be getting a, a, an expansion back with 115 codes and we're just pulling that into um, a set of Spark rows and creating a Spark data frame. So now we've got um, in memory across our cluster 
our um, parquet files holding our, our clinical data, and we've also got our, um, our expansion results, and we can then join those um, efficiently on the cluster and, re and reshape the data and prep it for our analytics. Um, so, this is in order. so the next step is, now we've got our e expansion, we can do stuff like um, join, my, join my patients and my conditions across to my value set where the system and the code match. So the system and the code in my condition.code match the system and the code in the value set expansion. And then we can just sort of say, well, is it there? Um, Boolean in value set, and we can come up with a, a data frame that's um, each patient and whether that their con each patient and their condition and whether that condition's in our value set or not. Feel free to ask questions as we go through, by the way. So, so we've got this um, disorder of glucose regulation value set here. Now we're looking at our list of codes and we're wondering, okay, well that should probably include pre-diabetes, I would have thought. But we've done our query and it um, turns out it doesn't actually capture this. Well, that's weird. Why is that happening? And now we're going to get into some of the quirks of what you might come across doing analytics on real data. So we look up pre-diabetes in shrimp and... Um, and we, and oh, hang on, this is yellow, which is bad. Um, and it turns out that this, this code is actually inactive. So at the time that somebody, and this is real actually, this is an inactive code in a Cynthia module, so it happens in synthetic data as well. Um, but at the time someone wrote this Cynthia module, that code was active, but, in, but SNOMED um, gets um, released quite regularly and Codes are retired, they're replaced by other codes. So since then, that code has been retired and it's actually been replaced with another code. So in Shrimp, you get this little link and you can click on that. And you can get to the um, code that ha it has been replaced by. And it's been replaced by impaired glucose tolerance, which luckily, probably not a coincidence, because I so it's orchestrated this. Um, it is a um, descendant of disorder of glucose regulation. So all we need to do is somehow figure out the, all these historical codes which have been replaced by stuff in our set. And, and we need to add that to our set basically because we want to be tolerant of historically captured data. Um, so, so as I was saying, you know, often... Th this, this happens, um, but luckily SNOMED CT itself includes um, the trail. So anything that's been retired has a relationship internally within SNOMED to um, codes that they were replaced by. And it also sort of has reason codes across, up against those relationships. So you can actually get quite a clear picture of what's happened there. And all this stuff can be queried through the Fire API. So this, this is a page within the fire spec, which is the SNOMED page, um, fire slash SNOMED ct.html. It's actually not that easy to find, just clicking through links in the spec. Right at the bottom of this page, there's a section called implicit concept maps. And th this talks about association reference sets within SNOMED. And there's four of them. And these are the different types of historical associations that there can be between codes in SNOMED. Um, and you can use these implicit concept maps to translate from one code to another, one code that has this relationship to another code. So you can use the concept map translate operation and you can pass the URL um, which mentions this code and you can actually have the server give you, um, traverse those relationships for you. So 
So this is what we're going to pass to our um, concept map translate um, operation. We're going to say the URL is this URL, which is a, a special URL, which is in the SNOMED part of the fire spec, and we're, we're putting in the replaced by code. So we want to see replaced by relationships. This is the um, code for uh, our um, disorder of glucose regulation. Um, sorry, no, sorry, it's the, the code for the code that pre-diabetes has been replaced by. So we've got our set of all the codes within disorder of glucose regulation. Each of those, we want to see if there's codes that have been replaced by those codes. So we're actually running this in reverse. Um, so we're instead of instead of saying give me the codes that this um, that that replace this code, we want to get the codes that are on the other side of the relationship. So if we run this for every code or each of our 115 codes under disorder of gl glucose tolerance, we will actually get all the historical codes which have been replaced by one of those. Does that make sense? And then we add those codes into that set. We make a broader set, a set which is tolerant of our historically captured data. So what, that, what our translate will come back with is, yes, there's a match. Um, pre, um, so this particular code um, replaced pre-diabetes. And it also replaced a bunch of other stuff, but we will add pre-diabetes and the others to our broader set. So now we go back to our value set, which used to be just this concept is a um, disorder of glucose regulation. And we'll add another include block here, which is just actually adding enumerated codes that we have discovered through our translation process. That's pretty much all I've got. So does anybody have any questions about that sort of stuff? Yeah. So what you've done the reverse to put it in the value set for all batteries that were not you can still see what the original codes were. Why not do it the other way around and when you first gather your data, technically clean the data so it is all using code codes rather than using the, the old codes? Well we we have to re clean it every time because if you're doing the analysis later it could be it could be replaced in between when you import it and when you analyze it. Okay. Yeah, so I suppose this is a more dynamic approach. Um, and yeah, like, like Jim says, you know, um, if you really want the answer at the time of which you're doing your analytic work, I suppose, um, and, and it could move, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi. So um, I'm not necessarily a physician. I'm a computer scientist, so this is not the first time I'm talking about this. Um, if I understand right, um, Simon's response is that you can do it literally like a graph. So me, a natural way of doing it would be a graph physically. So then you could say, well, the way to measure this is graph physically. Or uh, any sense? Um. I'm sure that's totally valid. Um, I suppose it depends on the use case. So for analytics, you're primarily wanting to do aggregate queries, full table scans. I just want numbers. I don't necessarily want to gather all my things within a certain part of the graph. I just want you to run over all these tables and give me a count, give me a mean, um, whatever. So it, um, you know, I think it's horses for courses, you know. Um, graph databases, I'm, I'm sure, have applicability. I don't really know much about them, um, really, in terms of I haven't actually um, done much implementation work with them. But for I've found that Spark um, is, is quite a good tool for the use case of 
sort of um, summarizing the data, which could potentially be large, and, um, and sort of augmenting the notebook flow as well. Because um, there is this problem that, you know, if you, you can't really deal with large data sets in that sort of envir localized environment. So it's nice to be able to sort of switch between a, a cluster and local a as it suits. But yeah, there's, there's all sorts of tools out there and I'm sure um, I'd, I'd love to play with them actually, so. Um, so I just realised I'm supposed to be um, uh, repeating the question. <laughs> so um, the question was, uh, what are some examples of some real world projects that we work on? So um, some of the examples are, um, so, so one of them is, um, you know, GP data. So we've got people who actually, um, believe it or not, code um, data after the fact, um, unstructured data, they code it into SNOMED for the purposes of analytics just because it um, brings with it a whole bunch of, um, you're, you're joining in that ontology, you're joining in that knowledge so it allows you to do more sophisticated analytics and we've had sort of things like, okay, we want to look at chronic diseases, so can you group um, all these records into a set of seven chronic disease categories for us. So we've taken, we've defined like seven SNOMED CT ECL expressions and value sets like that. And then people sometimes ask for things that don't make much sense, like um, we want them to be mutually exclusive and that sort of thing. Um, and you can do that as well. You can just make a hierarchy of these things and you can say, well, if it's not in this, it's in this and it's in this. And this. So that's one example. Another example is, you know, like genomic, genomics ordering workflow. So um, we were asked to um, have a look at um, people who were being referred to get genetic testing for um, uh, renal genetics um, and look at, so when, when you do that workflow, you have a, um, a diagnosis at the referral end. So the GP or the specialist makes a preliminary diagnosis. This is what I think it is. Off you go. Um, then you get to the genetic clinic and a, and a bunch of specialist geneticists say, well, actually, it's more likely this because we know better than you, simple referrer. Um, and um, then you actually go and have the test and there's a third diagnosis. Well, we tested it and this is what it actually is um, based on the evidence. And we wanted to look at, um, well, at these three points, do these diagnoses actually get more specific? You know, what's the diagnostic yield and are we actually making them more specific? And, and the value that SNOMED brought to that is that it has this built-in subsumption hierarchy so we can actually say, well, did this... Is this diagnosis subsumed by this diagnosis? Therefore, it is more specific. Therefore, we're actually drilling down, and we're and we're we're we're, we're getting more information as we go. So we're, we're talking about the value of this sort of genetic testing process. So that's sort of just a couple of examples. Um, the other thing to mention is, you know, this is obviously a pretty horrible process. It's um very involved um, and a lot of work. So the other work that we're doing is building tools to abstract this away. So we're building tools to um, actually um, automate this process of prepping your data for analytic tasks and machine learning algorithms and um, the ability to do aggregate query um, within a fire server rather than just your normal S CRUD and, um, you know, uh, uh, way of um, interacting with a fire server. So um, maybe we'll talk about that next year. I don't know. Any other questions? Uh, um, so c the, the, um, the question is any tips or tricks for code system versioning? So the reason that we um, 
uh, didn't touch much on code system versioning in this is because um, so in every code system um, there is a uh, element called version needed and it goes to the concept permanence um, uh, w within that code system. So SNOMED CT, for example, has guarantees about concept permanence. Once you create a concept, you never actually remove it. You just change the status of it. You change it to inactive, whatever. So you can always understand the code um, in something like SNOMED CT. But there's lots of code systems out there that are not like that. You know, version one might be A, B, C, D. Um, version two might be E, F, G, H, and there's actually um, no <laughs> sort of... Um, so when you... Um, so first thing, to, first thing to point out is if you're creating a code system, maybe do <laughs> um, use concept permanence as a principle because it makes everybody's life easier down the track and you don't have to do all these funky things with versions. But if you don't have that, then you have to be quite careful about how you refer to code systems within value sets and that sort of thing. So if, if there is a version needed, there's a version needed, right? And, um, and then if you, um, if you change the version, you've got to be aware of the downstream effects of that because you're suddenly introducing, you know, um, potentially breaking changes to people who are consuming that terminology. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that really um, helps, but that's pretty much all I've got. Any other questions? No worries. Well, thanks very much for coming along, and, and feel free to come up and ask any questions later on. <laughs>